I remember sitting in the locker room in Philadelphia, waiting for the last words from Bill Parcells before we go out. And I remember sitting there going, okay, hang in there. Just, you know, don't give up, hang in there, because I knew what was coming. Best player I've ever played with, or against, by far, Reggie Wright. The dominant defense player in this league. We were taking a whooping. And I remember looking in the eyes of some of the guys that were responsible for blocking Jerome Brown. I saw him on the sideline. Didn't want any more of that game. You guessed it, Jerome Brown. That was nothing but fear. Jerome Brown put fear in football players. You gonna be a football player when you grow up? Be the finest quarterback produced in the last 10 years. Philadelphia Eagles select Donovan McNabb. And they said, I'm the best decision this organization has ever made. You think you need to be That's all I need. Fortunately for me, I didn't lose my life, didn't lose my job. Football convinced me that life is a team game. That's right, it's a game for me. This is a story of two men who shared a profession, a team, and the same fate, dying young. Jerome Brown was the ninth overall pick in the 1987 NFL Draft, anchored the NFL's best defensive line, then died suddenly in 1992. His teammate and close friend, Reggie White, narrated this video tribute. I'll never forget that day in July. That day that came too early. My friend Jerome Brown was gone. I wish you could have known him. You should have known he loved life. Your children should have known he loved children. Get down! He was fun to be around. He was also misunderstood. I quit. When your children ask you, what kind of a man was Jerome Brown? Tell them an honest man who on this day, last May, introduced me to the people who understood him best. I'm gonna tell you one thing, Reggie. This is where I was brought up at, and they're gonna say what they wanna say. If it hurts your feeling or not, they're gonna tell you the truth. And that's who I get that from when it comes to football. Twelve years later, Reggie White died. Their final resting places are 600 miles apart, but their football lives together began at a summer camp in 1979. Jerome Brown was a high school player from Florida when he traveled to the University of Tennessee football camp. And it was there he met Reggie White, who was working as a counselor and coach. Reggie loved volunteering, and Jerome was just happened to be one of the players that came. You know, being three or four years older than a person is a lot sometimes. Um, especially impressionable ages in high school. And he just attached himself to Reggie during camp. Reggie went from camp volunteer to Tennessee volunteer. In four years on the defensive line, he was a two-time All-American and set the school record for sacks. Back, five, 
Reggie White, who is simply overpowering. Reggie then shocked the football world by signing with the USFL's Memphis Showboats. He chose the USFL because I was a senior in college and he wanted to stay close to home. And he thought it'd be a great transition for him to go to Memphis, Tennessee. In 1985, the Philadelphia Eagles held his NFL rights, but he was still under contract with the Memphis Showboats. That fall, new Eagles owner, Norman Brayman, made a bold statement. I made contact with the ownership of the Memphis team and paid them a million dollars, which was a hell of a lot of money back in 1985, and was able to bring Reggie to Philadelphia. Brayman's seven-figure offer was impressive, but Reggie couldn't get his number and had to play his first season wearing 91. We didn't have a lot of respect to think that he was as good as he was. We didn't know. The veteran guys were like, yeah, 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 prove it. We finally made it to the field, and he was a wrecking ball. I could see such awe in the face of the Giants' offensive lineman because he was running over them, uh, and they were they, there was a frightening look in their face. He was doing something that really had shook them up. I tell you, he's going to be a force. If he can be play this well the first time he plays, we can go around midseason. He'll really be going. As Reggie's NFL career was taking off, Jerome Brown had arrived with the Miami Hurricanes. Number 98 talked a big game and played an even better one. Big Jerome Brown, he's alone. They're coming into our field. Jerome Brown talked trash. Jerome Brown has had a sensational game. You could not run the football against him. We had a secret weapon, though. We had Troy Aikman. That day, that was my, my first introduction to Jerome Brown. Troy came out throwing. Somebody said, we got to get him out of the game. To the corner, good. Touchdown, Oklahoma. Next play, they were carrying Troy out of the game. Thanks to Jerome Brown. <laughs> Brown, number 98. Got twisted up and ended up breaking my leg. Really kind of impacted my entire career. I wound up transferring and then, you know, maybe wouldn't have made it to the NFL if it hadn't have been for that misfortune. In his senior year, Jerome was a consensus All-American and led an undefeated Miami team into the 1987 Fiesta Bowl. Before he left, he goes, don't believe everything you're going to see or read. He goes, we're going to try to get in their heads. We're going to try to intimidate them. The Hurricanes arrived dressed to kill, literally. And of course, made all kind of news. My Hurricanes come, they come to Arizona and battle for teams. When JB says it, that's what you do. We didn't come here to act monkeys with everybody. We came here to play football. Yes, we do know what you mean, Jerome. This is defensive tackle Jerome Brown, number 98 in your program, at the infamous Saturday night steak fry and walkout. Jerome and his teammates were, as they say, put out by the Penn State players' sketch. All American Jerome Brown is a team leader. Did the Japanese go and sit down and have dinner with Pearl Hawk and Cody Bond? No! no! Well, fellas, let's go. And the hurricane split in just the latest instance of good sportsmanship. Same crazy, Jerome. Not gonna change it anyways. If you say do, I won't do. If you say don't, I'll do. It's just like I'm just that type of like a big kid sometimes.
Jerome Brown was a big kid, while Reggie White was a man from day one in Philadelphia. And Reggie White came in unmolested. Reggie would average more than a sack a game for his Eagles career. But it was in the spring of 1987 that head coach Buddy Ryan made the move that would elevate Philadelphia into an elite NFL defense. It was the off season. Bill Parcells looked at me and he goes, hey, Sims, your life's about to change. I'm like, oh, oh what did I do now, you know? And he goes, he goes, our life's about to change. Jerome Brown's gonna be drafted by the Eagles. And I went, is he really that good? He goes, yes, sir, he is. Our life has changed. When Jerome Brown and Reggie White teamed up for the 1987 season, they were an odd couple off the field but kindred spirits on the defensive line. You got both of these guys on each end of the spectrum. You know, JB, the party guy that flips and plays like a beast. People look at us like we're crazy when we go on the field, and I could care less if we gonna still hit him in the mouth, regardless. Jerome Brown constantly moving and constantly talking. On the other side, you got Reggie White. Oh, oh hallelujah. He's the preacher man that flips and turns like a beast. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Neither one of them could be quiet. I mean, yeah, Reggie was either doing his impersonations or singing. No, I tell you. I tell you, you know my coach Buddy Ryan, I tell you, he's so ugly. When he cried, tears go down the back of his head and avoid his face, I tell you. And Jerome just, just, just couldn't keep his mouth shut. He's 28 years old and don't want to take a bath after practice. So if you see him in the streets, call the police. <laughs> Thank you. Reggie White was, was just a cut up. He was, he was one of those guys who loved to have fun. I'm gonna hit you hard. You hear me? You hear me? I'm the greatest, the greatest in the world. One time, Reggie White is doing Muhammad Ali to Muhammad Ali. And then Bill Cosby came by one time. So Reggie White is doing Bill Cosby to Bill Cosby. Now I'm gonna tell you sorry, sir, be quiet. The lighter side of Reggie White was often overshadowed by his more widely recognized spiritual side. I think it's important for me as a Christian athlete to spread the gospel while I'm playing football. Early in his career with the Eagles, Reggie started what he called his street corner ministry. Reggie, every Friday, would go into, the, into North Philadelphia, into the really bad areas of North Philadelphia, and he would bring food, and then he would deliver his message. I said to him one day, uh, I'd like to go with you some Friday and just watch you do what you do and, uh, and write about it. And Reggie said, I'll let you come with me on one condition. If you don't write about it. You knew about Reggie's faith. Reggie never pushed it on anybody. He never said, you know, you're going to hell, you know, you're going this, you're going. He, he never did any of that. Well, I have an opportunity personally to finally win a championship, and we're on the road there. Yes, 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 we are. Thank you, Father. He walked the walk, and he talked the talk. That was the man that he was. Reggie walked and talked while Jerome Brown ran and shouted. He was a wild child who didn't like to be confined. When we grew up going to church, he always had to wear a tie. Well, as Jerome became an adult, one of the things, the first things he got rid of was wearing a tie. He did not like to wear a tie. Buddy Ryan required everybody to wear suit and ties. 
And he sat at the front of the plane, checking off, are you fully dressed? But Buddy was a player's coach. And it's like, what do you tell Jerome Brown? He probably had a size 22 neck. Buddy Ryan cared more about wins and losses than ties. So Jerome didn't have to wear his Sunday best as long as he was at his best on Sunday. If you had 45 Jerome Browns, you'd win every game. I don't care what, they couldn't nobody beat you. And we've got to fight Jerome Brown. Like any big kid, Jerome enjoyed testing the limits of what he could do, both on and off the field. Jerome, I hope the starter comes on. Got about four race cars and motorcycles, so it keeps me out of trouble. Okay. We'd all time talk to him about speeding in the wrong places and this and that. Jerome would get on his motorcycle and ride across Veterans Stadium parking lot. It speeds upwards of 70, 80 miles an hour chasing seagulls I mean it was it was it was a hard thing to watch I think there were more than a few people I was one of them that thought he's living hard you know and you hold your breath you hold your breath He show up at home at four o'clock in the morning we got to be at practice by seven he goes out and practice and then he goes home and takes a nap and he said, let's go again. Jerome was still his young buck coming out of college and girls chasing him. And it takes a little bit more time for people to grow up than others. There was a wild side to Jerome and Reggie was constantly trying to get him to settle down. I saw Reggie as being the one that kind of kept Jerome in line and kind of gave him words of wisdom. I just, you know, sit back and I learn from Reggie. Now I feel like I'm at home because I can talk to him anytime I want to if I have a problem. We have a great relationship. Right now, uh, I think Jerome has a lot to learn and that's some, something I want to spend some time with him and try to help him learn. football life. You're playing in Philadelphia, and it was the worst turf at the time, the worst stadium in the world. I can't tell you how I hated going in there. I hated going in that place. By 1988, Buddy Ryan's Eagles possessed one of the league's most disruptive defenses. At the center of it were Reggie White and Jerome Brown. Buddy Ryan led personality mix with talent and it became greatness. Ryan won a Super Bowl in Chicago as the architect of the Bears' famed 46 defense. When he got to Philadelphia, they just called it Buddy Ball. And Reggie and Jerome were perfect for it. The philosophy defensively was to dominate. And it was to dominate through intimidation. Our defense, we're going to be aggressive until the end. We're going to try to punish and punish you. And if you don't like us or whatever, that's, that's besides the points. We're going to get paid anyway. Buddy believed that if you punish receivers, if you punish the quarterback, that the human part of them will break. Who are you going to double team? You're going to double team Reggie White? You're going to double team Jerome Brown? Who are you gonna block? Am 
my rookie year, I remember scrambling and I got tackled from behind and I, I was trying to figure out who was that. And I got up off the ground, it was Reggie White. And I remember thinking to myself, if I can't outrun someone that big, I'm gonna be taking a lot of hits. You know, he'd hit you, start to take you down, and man, he wanted to make sure you got the full effect. I used to call it the dead fish. Jerome Brown was just strong. I mean, I was like, okay, you're there, I'm here, and I'm getting ready to whoop your butt. He has that ability to get low and lift you up out of the way. That's why double teams couldn't even work. It was the most phenomenal thing in the world to watch. You'd come off the ball, he just goes, wah! And you're laying on the ground, and he's in the backfield with his quickness. That defense, to me, was by far uh, the most imposing and dominating I've ever seen. He can bull and rush you. Or he can run around you. Now they can fake run around you and bull. They hit me one time very hard, both of them. And Jerome starts patting me on the butt going, that's it, hang in there now. That away, good job, hang in there. You're okay, you're, hang in there. And I was like, is he meaning this as a compliment? Or is he like, oh, please don't leave because we love hitting you. The Eagles won 31 games in three years. We got a ball for you. Hey. Great job. and became the team no one wanted to play. The signature game of Buddy Ryan's defense came in 1990. 11 Redskins were sidelined during what is affectionately referred to in Philadelphia as the body bag game. Boy, what an unfortunate night for the Redskins, who have been battered tonight. Don't come in our backyard and talk trash. You can talk it in your own backyard. But when you come to our backyard and you try to start something, you always get your butt kicked. They were a team that liked to bully teams. They were a team that felt that they could win by intimidating teams. But they were a team that tended to take things for granted more than they should. Things like playoff victories. And the Chicago Bears are going to defeat the Philadelphia Three straight years, the Eagles lost in the first round of the postseason. And a disappointment for Buddy Ryan, who has now gone 0-3 as a playoff coach with the Eagles. My theory was the road to the Super Bowl went through Philadelphia in those days. It's just the Eagles never took it. Following the Eagles' third consecutive playoff loss, Buddy Ryan was replaced by offensive coordinator Rich Kotite. It was like a betrayal that Norman Brayman has gotten rid of our coach. And not only that, he's bringing his other guy in who was on the team, his offense coordinator. Was this in the plan all the time? Now you've got an offensive head coach in Richie Kotite, and he didn't have a good relationship with the defensive side. Defense is up. In fact, I remember guys having to keep Jerome away from Richie because there was a big spat one day, and um, and he was going after Kotai. It really hurt the whole chemistry of the team. They had already lost Buddy Ryan, and on opening day 1991, they lost quarterback Randall Cunningham for the season. But the defense rallied and became just the fifth defense in NFL history to finish first against the pass, first against the run, and first overall. You didn't look at 91 like, hey, 
we're heading downhill. We're looking at it when Randall gets healthy, we're back in the hunt again. Ah, let's go with it, baby. Let's go with it. The feeling was we have this defense. This is this good. If we get Randall back next year healthy. That's going to be our championship run. Coming up. A guy walked up to me. His name was Skip. And he looked at me and said, I am so sorry. And I said, so sorry about what? He goes, oh my goodness, you don't know. Uh, look, Harry, I'm working. That means more money. <laughs> and who said I don't work in the off season? Took me four years, but I learned. They said it couldn't be done. Guess I grown up a little bit. He was just starting to grow up. And it was good to hear. He was talking about uh, investing money and buying a business. Because he pretty much on the first contract took care of the family, got his toys, and now it was time to think about his future. But Jerome never forgot his past. He grew up in Brooksville, Florida, a small town one hour north of Tampa. He left for Philadelphia in 1987, but Brooksville never left him. The people of Brooksville loved him. He gave money to the school, to the city, to the organization. You know, he was the one when the KKK came through, held up the sign, KKK, go away. Jerome had a connection with whether it was the African-American community, the white community. He had a way of bringing the community together. He would consider my mom his second mom, and I did that with uh, Miss Annie Bell, too, Jerome's mom. We both called him mom. This is the T-shirt that, that Jerome brought me the night of my retirement party out on Old Crystal River Road. He walked in there, and he said, Here, Mom, this is for you. Once he was your friend, he, he was for always. In the spring of 1992, he asked Reggie White and the rest of his Eagles teammates to help with the first annual Jerome Brown football camp. It was very important to him to bring back whatever he had gained out in America back to little bitty Brooksville. I'm gonna start recruiting time here. Where we at, Bloomfield? What is this, Bloomfield we're in? No. Brooksville. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Reggie would have a crew. Jerome would have a crew. Catch the leg room, man. Other leg puts me up. And he was just a happy young man. We didn't worry about anything then. I quit. This camp going through. I quit. <laughs> I don't want to sit another kid after one o'clock. I am T totally tired. But it turned out just fine. It was something that I saw in his eyes that he was so proud of accomplishing. Um, within a month and a half later, he was gone. Police are still trying to piece together the accident that took the life of the Eagles two-time All-Pro. Jerome also had a passenger in the car, his nephew, 12-year-old Gus Brown. We couldn't get chance to see him. We had to go to the hospital to see him. And uh, he had passed. He had my little grandson with him. And he was gone too. And that hurt it. The car slid off the road and hit a light pole, killing them both. 
it had rained earlier and apparently the pavement was slick and he lost control it it flipped and i think the t-tops were off so basically broke his neck and uh, we lost him and gus sorry era before the internet and text messages. The news of Jerome Brown's death traveled slowly. I remember getting a call from my dad. He told me that Jerome had passed and he said, you need to go and get your sister. Don't tell her. Don't listen to the radio. Uh, turn the television off. I recall seeing his picture on TV. But it wasn't odd for me to see Jerome on TV. He's always on TV. Once we actually arrived, my parents explained that it wasn't an accident, and both of them were gone. Reggie White was back in Philadelphia's veteran stadium as the guest speaker for the Billy Graham crusade. Reggie was told of Jerome's death moments before he took the stage, then broke the news to the Philly faithful. Tonight I had planned on sharing my testimony, but it's kind of been altered. Today, I lost a great friend. Philadelphia lost a great player. Jerome Brown died today. You know, this man was a very special man to me. His family were very special people. Out of all the stuff that you heard about Jerome Brown and the things said about him and neither the negative stuff this man was one of the greatest people I ever met and knew in my life. Until they closed the casket, we all thought Jerome was pulling a prank. I remember talking to a couple other guys, and one of them was like, Jerome's gonna jump up. Jerome's gonna get us. Jerome, he's, he's just messing with us right now. And when they closed the coffin, that was tough. It was fun to be around. He, like myself, were two big kids in grown men's bodies. And we enjoyed life. When we got to the cemetery, it was a known thing of his teammates that Jerome didn't like to wear a tie. I can remember Reggie White taking off his tie. And as he took off his tie, he laid that tie right on the coffin. It was Reggie and another teammate and Clyde. Every guy take off his tie and just leave it right there. That was kind of our, you know, to him, yeah, here you go. You know, we're not going to wear them either. It was a moment Jerome would have enjoyed, for sure.
next on a football life. We got to continue to do it. We can't bank on next year. If we're going to do it, it's got to be this year. Take me on three. One, two, three. Take Take me. me. The loss of Jerome Brown was a huge loss. He was not just a tremendous player coming off his best season, but he was also kind of a life force within that team. It really changed the room. I mean, you walked in the room, it just it sounded different, it felt different. All the joking which uh, Jerome always kept going wasn't there as much. And I think uh, Reggie stepped in that for a while afterwards because there was this big gap there. Reggie was going through a hard time and he took it very hard, but his mission got stepped up because life is not promised. In the aftermath of Jerome's death, two promises were made. First, the Eagles vowed to build a community center in Jerome's honor. After the funeral, Reggie and uh, Keith Jackson came in our family restaurant, and Reggie said, Miss Jenkins, if you can get this town to donate $100,000 to build a center, we will match it. And I looked at them and I said, we cannot raise $10,000, let alone 100000 And they said, oh, yes, you can. Then Reggie and his teammates dedicated the 1992 season to Jerome. It's going to be hard without Jerome there. But guys know that Jerome wanted the championship more than anything. And hopefully it'll be an a added boost to us all to get it done. On opening day, the Eagles retired number 99. The one thing we will always have here is our memories of Jerome Brown. His memories will be here forever. And let's make sure that throughout this season, that this whole stadium rocks loud enough for Jerome Brown can hear us. The Eagles started the season 4-0. There was a sense of urgency surrounding the team. Every year we say, well, this is our year, this is our year. And I'm pretty much getting tired of saying this is our year. We got the team to do it. We can't bank on next year. If we're going to do it, it's got to be this year. Everything about that 92 season was we're going to win it for Jerome. We're going to win it for Jerome. Seth Joyner had 99 carved into the back of his hair. His locker was like a shrine. They left his locker exactly as he left it. And it just stayed right there next to Reggie's locker the whole year. You know, a lot of times when you circle the wagons around someone, that that has a shelf life. That's what we play football for. For my man JP, doing it. Taking it to the house. But we really kept going with it. I mean, it really, Jerome really helped carry us. Take me on three. One, two, three. Take me. won 11 games and a wild card berth. In search of their first postseason win in over a decade, they traveled to New Orleans for the first round of the playoffs. When the players came in the locker room that Sunday at the Superdome, Jerome's locker was there. The guys on the team didn't know it. They had brought all his stuff down, and they had set it all up, hung it all up, and they had it there with, with everybody else's. Uh, and it had an effect. The idea that he was with that team that day, people could say, oh, that's hokey stuff. But if the players believed it, then it's real. And the players believed it. On first down, e Bear is going to throw. He Go back 
goes a bear. He's hit. He's safety. Safety. It's going to be a safety, or is it? If they yes, give it a safety. The Eagles have blown the roof off the Superdome. The Eagles have blown the roof off the Superdome. We were winning the Super Bowl. We were. You know, that's how confident we were. You're going to Dallas, Jay! You're going to Dallas, Jay! We just felt it was going to be for Jerome. We were good enough to win it. And that's what we're going to do. Against Dallas, having Jerome in their hearts wasn't enough. The Eagles needed Jerome on the field. Another long offseason for Reggie White. And a lot of questions as to whether he'll be back in a green uniform next year. Reggie's plan was to stay with Philadelphia. I mean, we did an addition. We had a 2,000 square feet house. We got little ones that are babies. And we just knew we were going to be in South Jersey forever until he retired. That was just the way it went. But by allowing himself to be a named plaintiff in the player's antitrust case against the NFL, Reggie White had become the face of free agency. Reggie and other players who had exercised the right of free agency wanted to investigate other opportunities. That was what they battled for. In Philadelphia, fans were outspoken about their desire to keep Reggie in Eagles green. He told Jimmy Sexton, Jimmy says, you can go anywhere you want. He said, I want to stay with the Eagles. Well, Norm is not offering a contract. Bridge like, what do you mean? You know, Mr. Brame is not offering a contract. Well, he's not offering you anything. And we did make a tender offer to Reggie White, and I remember that tender offer was $15 million. I don't remember how many years that was to be spaced over, but I remember a $15 million offer that was made. I don't know exactly the timing of it, uh, but at the same time, uh, we would like to have had Reggie stay. If you remember, uh, Reggie at that time said that he's going to go where God tells him to go. If Nor Mr. Brayman offered Reggie anything, anything to stay with Philadelphia, Reggie would have stayed in Philadelphia. Reggie did not want to leave Philadelphia. Believing there was no contract offer, Reggie embarked on a whirlwind free agency tour. I called my wife uh, this morning. She said, how'd it go? I said, hey, I was the lead store in the news last night, so. On April 6, 1993, Reggie White again shocked the football world by signing with the Green Bay Packers. Up to that point, it was 25 years previous is when the Packers were the Packers. So to get a free agent, the quality of, of Reggie White, uh, when other teams were just beating down the door to get him, uh, my thought was, you know, to me, is one of the all-time great steals in, in free agency. Next, on a football life. Reggie what? got him again! Reggie. They got him again! Hello, Reggie! The first time Reggie White told me he loved me, I, I, man, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I felt a little uneasy, you know, like. That's a little kind of cushy, cushy, Reggie. Maybe it was awkward at first, but after a while, you just got, you know. I, I can't tell you how many times I talked to Reggie on the phone. We'd go hang up. Oh, I love you, Brett. You know, we just, we just felt, uh, I love you too, Reggie. Yeah. You know? But, I mean, it was, he made it easy. Reggie 
White joined the Green Bay Packers in 1993 and helped revitalize the NFL's most storied franchise. He was considered one of the best defensive players in NFL history and on the brink of completing what he could never finish in Philadelphia. He talked about that team in Jerome. He felt like there's no doubt whatsoever they should have won a Super Bowl. Can you be fulfilled without a Super Bowl ring? Oh, yeah, I can be fulfilled. I mean, uh, my life has already been fulfilled. Uh, I realized one thing that, uh, you know, even though you win a championship, uh, pretty soon life is going to end. I want to be able to attain the goal of reaching heaven more than a championship. It has finally arrived, the day we've waited for, I guess, for about 29 years now for the Green Bay Packers to play in the Super Bowl. In Super Bowl 31, the Packers led early, but the New England Patriots mounted a second half comeback, and then Reggie ended it. Is this heaven or what? It don't get any better than this. What if I do win a championship like I have? After retiring as the NFL's all-time sack leader, like Reggie continued his spiritual journey by learning Hebrew and taking a pilgrimage know, to Israel. But it, I'm a order. If I'm going to find God, I better go find it for myself. I got to go back and research the scripture in its original language to see what it says. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. One of the great statements that Reggie White said, and I'll try to say it in, in the best Reggie White voice I can, he said, you know, K. Jack, if I'm only known when I pass away for being a football player, then I failed at life. On Christmas Day 2004, Reggie and Sarah attended a midnight movie. When we came back, um, it was very late at night, and um, there was something going on in the stars, and Reggie said something about something's going to happen tonight. He woke up choking, gasping, and I didn't know what he was doing. It was 7 o'clock in the morning, but I turned the light on, I looked over, and he was gasping for air. So I quickly called 911, and my kids were still sleeping, and then, you know, got rushed to the hospital, and 45 minutes later, they pronounced them dead. The cause of death was complications from sarcoidosis and sleep apnea. The circle of uh, our family was broken, but now Reggie and Jerome are right in the middle of all that, and we just, you know, close up ranks and still keep those guys in our, in our thoughts and memories, you know, each and every day. I mean, I, I really hate to, really hate to even think about it, you know, because it do bring back a lot of memories, because Reggie White was a good man. It was like hearing the news that Jerome had died again. How how does Re how does Reggie die? Reggie White's not supposed to die. You know that guy is gonna live forever, but it didn't happen. He has so much more things to do in his life. 
he was going to do something huge. You know, I'm not sure Reggie White, he'd have been the, the head of the players' union. I mean, the players would have went, yes. Reggie White left behind his wife, Sarah, and two children. Last year, you went swimming. It doesn't hurt like it used to hurt. It's an anger, but it's not a mad at you anger, but it's an anger question. Like, why couldn't you wait? At least till I got 70. Jerome Brown is buried in Brooksville, Florida not far from the community center that bears his name. It was completed eight years after his death and stands as a tribute to the town's favorite son. Reggie White rests near Charlotte, North Carolina. The Packers and Eagles retired his number and in 2005, he was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. As teammates, they shared a patch of turf for too short a time, hoping next year would be their year. But next year never came. Reggie White and Jerome Brown were gifted at their craft, but were denied the greatest gift length of days but in their time they created memories that filled the hearts of friends and fans and family people could say Jerome and Reggie were different but yet they were the same in many ways they had great personality traits that were alike that made them mesh into friends I see the connection there that lets you know that they were meant to be. They were meant to be.